This is Duke University. Thank you all so much for coming in today to the Forum on Scholars and Publics. Uh, our event is on Ebola and cholera and how the media sort of forms an interface between us and what's going on in the world. Uh, I'd like to thank Chris Wall Haiti Lab um, for hosting this along with the uh, Forum for Scholars and Publics and the Franklin Humanities Institute. Uh, our panelists today, well I should say, hopefully the, form, uh, the format of this event is going to be an informal discussion. So we'll, we'll speak a little bit among ourselves for about 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to you guys and I really hope we can all um, you know, share our thoughts and ask questions. Uh, so feel free to speak up. Uh, so our panelist today is Priscilla Wall, Professor Priscilla Wall, who is a professor here at Duke in the English Department and Women's Studies Department. Uh, her book is called Contagious, Cultures, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative. Uh, our second panelist is journalist Jonathan Katz, uh, whose book is called The Big Truck That Went By, How the World Came to Save Haiti and Left Behind a Disaster. Um, so to start, Priscilla, I'd like you to just speak a little bit about this concept of the outbreak narrative and how you see it working today or in the recent past or in the context of Haiti or West Africa. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what I call the outbreak narrative is a story that um, initially came out of a 1989 conference that coined the term emerging infections or disease emergence. And this was um, uh, after, in the 1970s, um, uh, medical epidemiologists and medical professionals really felt with the, um, once they had addressed, the, with the last um, wild case of smallpox um, resolved, they felt that, you know, while we were able to get smallpox under control, and this will be the way communicable disease will go in general. So this is not going to be a problem for the future. Communicable disease will be something we can easily address, um, and we should turn our energies elsewhere. Um, all the while they were saying this, the first um, outbreaks of Ebola and other hemorrhagic fevers were emerging. And then, of course, starting in you know, the early 80s, people began to um, realize HIV-AIDS was making the global rounds. Um, so this conference in 1989 said, what are these problems? They're really all coming from the same thing. Um, they're a result of... Um, changes in you know the, the world. We have better transportation. People are traveling more. We have um, growing population and development, and people are moving into areas they haven't been before, and they're encountering new microbes. Um, and these are uh, microbes to which we don't have uh, herd immunity, so they're really blowing through a population. And out of this, what I study is how. Uh, so, so what they said is this is not just a problem for science and medicine and epidemiology. This is a geopolitical problem. This is a social problem. But what I study is how the narrative that came out of that. So first there were publications in the sciences, then uh, publications for the general public, then the mainstream media, and then popular fiction and film. In fact, how many here have seen the film Outbreak? Dustin Hoffman. Oh, you've got to run out and see Outbreak. <laughs> so Outbreak is the Outbreak narrative. Um, and what happened, so what happened is the way that the story got told publicly, what I call a cultural narrative, and, you know, it's very much evident in the film, is, you know, oh, we have this problem, and in the United States the way it got told is we have this problem happening in Africa, and it's getting into the net, right, the worldwide, uh, you know, the, the, our transportation systems, and, you know, we can travel anywhere in 24 hours, and it's making the rounds, and it's threatening our metropoles, and the expertise is going to, the, the problem is happening mostly Africa, but the global south, the solution is the global north, and contra what this conference was trying to convey, the way this story got told was, there is a species threatening event, we have these heroic epidemiologists and scientific medicine coming from the global north, and ultimately will contain the threat. So the drama of the story is outbreak, threatening the world, threatening the species, containment. And that's the outbreak narrative. Um, and what I've talked about in my work is all the various problems with that narrative. A little longer than it's um, Can you say a few words about how you see in the media right now um, 
that that narrative playing out and either succeeding or failing? Mm -hmm. So there are two problems that I have seen with the contemporary coverage of Ebola, which is absolutely following the pattern of the outbreak narrative. And those problems are, first of all, you have the kind of stigmatization, the, the hysterical reaction. This is a species-threatening event. You know, there's one case in New York, and you know, that's it. We're all we're all doomed. Um, it's going airborne. You know, CNN called it classic outbreak uh, narrative language. CNN called it the ISIS of of um, pandemics or epidemics. Um, so you know, you get that kind of language. You get an overreaction. This has social consequences, people, places, behaviors get stigmatized, it has economic consequences. Um, when it really gets bad, you know, you have the problem of our first responders going to do their job? Um, are people going to go to the emergency room with every cold and flood the emergency room? Or conversely, are they not going to go to the emergency room because they're afraid and they're going to stay home when they should go to the emergency room for other problems? You know, these are some of the problems. The other side, that I found very interesting was the, the opposite, and I keep saying, I have a phrase, the opposite of panic in this case was not calm, but complacency. So because part of the outbreak narrative is, oh yes, we've seen this before, it's going to be resolved, organizations like the World Health Organization and the CDC um, didn't react as quickly as they might have. And because the assumption was, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we've seen that before. So on the one hand, you get the kind of hysterical panic, and on the other hand, you get the, we've seen this before. Um, I do see one change. I see more and more journalists cautioning against the fear. And I see more and more journalists talking about what I think the real problem is that the crisis narrative doesn't allow us to address. So in, the, in a crisis, what you need is quarantine, medicine, um, vaccination, right? You need, thank you, you need some kind of, you know, things that are going to contain it. And that's urgent and that's what you have to do. But the problem is that the crisis language gets, a, gets attached to the problem. And what you don't get is a larger story of how we should be, in the broader sense, addressing that, this problem. So, for example, the greatest single vector that turns an outbreak into an epidemic and an epidemic into a pandemic is poverty. And we should be addressing the problems of global poverty. Margaret Chan, head of the WHO, has talked about this. Economists like Amartya Sen have talked about this. Paul Farmer, so activists around this issue. Um, the UN, Millennium, Millennium Development um, Goals, are you know talk about this. Um, why are we not addressing this problem? So again, the outbreak narrative to me is replacing the more um, considered stories that we should be telling about the problem of outbreaks and um, disease emergence. So, you know, but, but I am hearing more and more journalists trying to tell that story, trying to talk about the need to address poverty, trying to put it in a larger frame. And, you know, it doesn't sell, it's not sensational, it's not the tantalizing, titillating story that, you know, Ebola exclamation point, apocalypse exclamation point is. And there's, I think, where the problem is. That's actually a really excellent segue to bringing Jonathan into the conversation. Um, Jonathan, do you want to respond to that at all, either from your experience covering the cholera outbreak in Haiti, or I know that you're an astute observer of current events um, and the media, so if you'd like to speak about what you're seeing uh, today, feel free. Yeah, I mean, as, as a resident representative of the mainstream media, um, I think that one of the things that's really interesting, first of all, uh, narratives in general are something that we as journalists confront, I think to an extent that the public doesn't always realize. Some of my friends refer to it as, you know, being able to see the matrix when you <laughs> see that. Uh, when, you know, when you're reading the coverage, you know, seeing the way it plays out. And, and one of the things that I, I, I can say as an emissary from the mainstream media is that while there are story meetings and budget meetings and conversations between editors and reporters, we don't all sit around at the beginning of one of these things and say, okay, what, which narrative are we going to pull out of the box and, and how do we want to process it through it? It happens much more organically than that because, frankly, 
we see the same movies as everybody else. We grew up reading the same news coverage as everybody else, and then one day we find ourselves in a position to actually be writing about it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have any idea of what we're doing. We may be very good at a number of other things, but this may not be one of them. And so, in the case of the cholera epidemic in, in Haiti, because that's obviously something that I had a, a very front row seat to in, in 2010, um, there were there was I think uh, I didn't know of the outbreak narrative as a category at the time, but in retrospect, I definitely see it unfolding. There was another narrative that plugged in very quickly for. Those of you who don't remember the timeline of events, in 2010, in January of 2010, there was a massive earthquake in southern Haiti. It killed an estimated 316,000 people. It did quite a lot of damage. It, it basically destroyed the, the vast majority of the capital city, Port-au-Prince, killed about 1 in 10 people there, and it uh, totally destroyed a number of other towns around it. And there were immediate narratives that we as the media just sort of, and also, by the way, responders and UN system and the US government and everybody else who was coming in immediately put into practice because there are things that you expect to see when there's a disaster. So just to give a brief example of another kind of narrative, you expect to see all kinds of uh, social unrest and disorder and panic, um, which you actually don't tend to see in the wake of disasters, but that was one thing that we expected that, that people went out chasing. Another thing that you expect to see wrongly in the wake of a natural disaster is a follow-on epidemic. We just sort of assume and there are reasons for this, we can go into them, some of them are historical, some of them are Hollywood, some of them are just imagination or the sense that tragedy comes in pairs instead of coming individually, that when you have a big thing like an earthquake, you're going to have an outbreak of disease. And actually, this isn't true. There, there, there's actually been uh, quite a bit of work done on this subject by a number of epidemiologists, disease experts, they've gone back, they've studied natural disasters over time, and you don't find any correlation, certainly between a disaster such as an earthquake and a, a disease epidemic. What ends up happening was the cholera outbreak emerged rather suddenly, but nine months after the earthquake had occurred. And it began in dramatic fashion uh, with you know unexplained deaths starting to occur at one hospital in a central part of Haiti in a town called San Marc. That was sort of the first win that we got that this was happening. Uh, people were showing up with symptoms of uh, uh, severe diarrhea, vomiting, fever, other things that are good to talk about during a lunch meeting. And uh, they, this is a very well chosen lunch topic. And and immediately, the first thing, before we knew that it was cholera, before we knew anything else, we were just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And by we, I mean both media and responders and authorities in Haiti, and just people in Haiti. And the immediate narrative that this got plugged into, before it becomes plugged into the outbreak narrative, is the disaster narrative. And if you go back and you look at the coverage that was happening at the very beginning, um, or at least a couple days in, once uh, once the stories that we were doing from there started sort of catching people's attention in, in the wider world, uh, you know, you have Brian Williams on NBC Nightly News saying, you know, this is the disaster that we were waiting for. This is what we expected when we landed. You know, and it was an opportunity for news organizations that hadn't been in Haiti throughout, that had been there for the earthquake and then left shortly thereafter, to remind everybody that they were there during the earthquake. And this was another opportunity to sort of tie the two together. And to break the suspense, the cholera epidemic had absolutely nothing to do with the earthquake. I mean, nothing. <laughs> it did not, not even like, well, we could sort of, nothing. Um, it, was, it, it emerged in a totally separate part of the country. It, was in, uh, it, it, it started in central Haiti, whereas the earthquake had, had uh, occurred in southern Haiti. Um, it didn't even really have to do with uh, displacement of people, the fact that people were congregating in camps, none of that. Uh, and it took uh, a lot of people a long time to see it. And one of the clear instances, um, one of the things that made it so clear in this particular case, is that my reporting um, and uh, some other work that was done, especially by a couple of key epidemiologists, one in particular, a guy named Renaud Piro from France, showed that this particular outbreak was caused by United Nations peacekeepers who were bivouacked in central Haiti 
they, they weren't even strictly related to the earthquake because the UN peacekeeping mission had been in place in Haiti since 2004. Okay, so for six years by that point. Um, and they were sort of on a regular rotation. They had rotated in from an active cholera outbreak in Nepal, their home country. They were put at a base where the UN had constructed uh, adequate sanitation facilities, and basically the waste from their base flowed into a nearby river, which was a tributary of the most important river in Haiti, the Artibonite, basically like the Mississippi River of Haiti. Um, and that river became an artery of disease and it spread from there. And among the things that made it hard for a lot of, uh, frankly, my colleagues, even within my own organization, um, and, and uh, I think the wider world, and also, by the way, readers in general and, and viewers, to understand that this is what had happened was that we were so married to this initial narrative. We were so married to the idea that, of course, A, you would get a disease outbreak following a natural disaster, and B, that you would get a disease outbreak from a diseased country. And I think that this is something that That's we're... Exactly it. Yeah, that we're totally seeing right now in West Africa. Um, the idea that Haiti, Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, that these are countries that are sort of endemically contagious. Yep. And uh, that has to do with race, it has to do with poverty, mm -hmm. um, it has to do with uh, uh, differences in language, although obviously that's less of a case with Liberia, um, but it's, it's still an important factor. Uh, you know, Haiti is a country that had, uh, for, for those of us old enough in the room, older than me, to remember the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, Haiti, uh, at the uh, very beginning, before AIDS had a name, uh, the CDC, the same U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that we depend on for, for information right now, um, identified four major risk groups for uh, dis uh, transmission of, of HIV, they called them, they were known as the four H's, of these, uh, homosexuals, heroin users, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. And they walked it back within a couple of months, but by that point, it was over. Everybody in the United States, you can talk. Well, and, and I want to pick up on that, because yeah. what you're saying is really important about narrative. Mm -hmm. A narrative is like a technology. Mm -hmm. Once you start to see it in a certain way, that's how you're going to keep seeing it, and it's hard to see around it. So it makes certain things more visible and other things less. Gay-related immunodeficiency. RID. Anyone? Is that a term familiar to anyone? Um, do, can someone say what it is? What was the term? Gay-related immunodeficiency. We had someone who yeah, so it was one of the original names of AIDS. It's what AIDS was called before it yes. became autoimmune. It was called gay-related. Yes. So once they moved from the 4-H's, it was RID. And they thought, okay, so RID, gay-related immunodeficiency, it meant that if you were a gay man who went to your doctor with certain <laughs> symptoms, your doctor was much more quickly going to identify this disease, right? So that it helped in that way to make it more visible to doctors. On the other hand, if you were a woman who went to the doctor with those symptoms, or initially, or much more importantly, um, they're, they're, you, know, you were going to be less quickly identified, but much more importantly, it told doctors how to look for the transmission. And they were not, therefore, looking at, for example, blood. And it took, some uh, critics have said at least, some critics have said as much as two years more than it should have to identify blood as a transmission of HIV and be able to, to pinpoint that and therefore address the problem of the blood supply than it should have. And it was precisely because grid. We have this narrative. We have a name for the disease. We know how to identify it. So everything you're saying is spot on in terms of how narrative works, how the outbreak narrative work, works, how naming something works. And similarly, if you go back through the history of uh, epidemics, in particular cholera, um, which is one of the diseases that spawned a lot of these narratives uh, in, in the 19th century, um, we, we, we now associate, you hear the word cholera and you think of it as sort of a, an old disease, an archaic disease, um, a disease of, of the other. But that's essentially because that's what the narrative came up with in the 19th century. Cholera is actually not an old disease as far as the world basically outside of the Ganges River Valley is concerned. It's a disease of globalization. Um, it begins spreading in the, the first pandemic in the early 19th century because of trade routes. And that's how it ends up spreading around the world. And the places where it ends up hitting hardest at first 
are basically the, the you know what we now consider to be the major capitals of Western civilization. It's killing tens of thousands of people in London, in Hamburg, um, in New York, in Chicago, in Montreal, and because it was, it was uh, if you go back to sort of the original writings on it in the 19th century, it's often referred to as Asiatic cholera. It's seen as this very much in line with the conversations right now about Ebola. It's this weird alien thing. It comes from it comes from poor people in a poor place who are invading our borders. You can go back and look. There were political cartoons drawn where you see like. You know the ship coming in, bringing the immigrants, and on the front of the ship is you know a skeleton, and, and you've got like the the guys on the shore at you know Ellis Island who are armed with you know uh, bottles of chlorine or whatever they were going to use to clean it, and there was there were huge reprisals all over the world. Um, my family came from uh, the Pale of Settlement from Russia in the late 19th century in, in to New York, and. Uh, Jews like my family, other people who are coming from Eastern Europe, were seen as bringing this disease, and you see a lot of the same discussion going on that you see right now with, you know, those people. And and one of the interesting things, looking at the coverage of the Ebola epidemic, is that you know we worry about uh, a nurse who lands in New Jersey after having been in contact with those people. But we don't worry as much about the you know the doctors and the nurses who are working here with Americans who've been sick with Ebola, even though we know that there's been patient to, to uh, nurse transmission, there are two cases in, in Dallas as an example. Um, and so you don't worry about those. I'm not sure. I think everybody is so frantic about Ebola. Mm -hmm. I have seen. I mean, some one of you know the nurse who traveled to Ohio and they were going to close down the. That's true. I I think That's that true. the disease itself. And the disease is carrying the stigma of its place of ostensible origin. Right. In this case, we know it is the origin, right? HIV, still unclear. But, you know, I, I think it's the disease, if, you know, tr the, the fear travels with the disease. I agree. Don't, I guess don't worry is an overstatement. When I'm thinking of Casey Hickox, what, what I'm thinking of is the fact that, you know, she's taken off the plane and escorted to the tent yeah. and, then, and then, you know, gets to go to Maine and then is chased around Maine. Yeah. Um, to, to an extent that, say, uh, I mean, we heard nothing at the same moment about the doctors at Bellevue Hospital in New York who were treating the only case of Ebola present in the entirety of, of the United States. And if you look at the political narrative um, uh, that cropped up in the election, this was a huge issue here in, in North Carolina. Um, in the, I, I mean, I think we're still doing postmortems. Um, as soon as I leave, I'm going to do another one on uh, what happened in the election last night between Tom Tillis and, and Kay Hagan. But one of the moments that you saw uh, the race start to change after it looked like Hagan might be walking away with a, a narrow victory was uh, two things happened simultaneously. Uh, attention was put on ISIS, um, which, like Ebola, had been a problem for a while but hadn't really been considered a, a major problem by Americans until it started affecting some of our and, uh, and Ebola. And I remember at that debate in October between the two of them, it became, it's a, it was an intensely political issue, but the way in which it was talked about was not in terms of public health at all. It was not in terms of globalization or the spread of diseases or health infrastructure or foreign aid or the effects of US foreign policy in West Africa, or any of that stuff. It was talked about in terms of national security and immigration. And Tom Tillis very effectively brought Ebola into that debate as an answer to a question about undocumented mm -hmm. migrant children coming into the United States from Latin America, which as we all know is a major hotbed of Ebola <laughs> and, and it was effective. And, 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 and Hagen, to her discredit, had no response to this. I mean, she, she didn't say, you know, That's wait a minute, Tom, this is crazy. What are you, <laughs> you know? Uh, she didn't say, you know, it was, she was just like, I am also very concerned. She was too busy trying to deny that she was really a Democrat. Like, that's, you know. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and so, um, uh, yeah, and so, you know, you go back over the, over the history of, of uh, these diseases and these epidemics, and you just see the same thing over and over again. And, and one of the things that was amazing in the, in the case of Haiti, and also I think amazing in the case of uh, the West African countries that had not had prior experience with Ebola, is how quickly we endemicize, I guess, the disease to a place that is actually brand new. Did you, sorry, no. Oh, I was just going to say, there had never been a documented case of cholera before 
the laboratory confirmed case of cholera before in the history of Haiti, ever. This is a country that's been independent since 1804. Okay, so it was independent all through all of the major cholera epidemics. Um, we know for a fact that the pandemic strain that is going around the world right now, because the seventh current pandemic began in the early 1960s, just after the advent of laboratory testing, so it could have been done. We know where that disease went. We know that the 1991 Peru outbreak that went through the Western Hemisphere didn't affect the Caribbean. We know all that. It had never been in Haiti before. But every time, uh, well, every time uh, you bring this up, perhaps including right now, I'm not sure, um, you know, somebody puts up their hand and says, well, how could this possibly be true? And it's just true because cholera is a very specific infection, and it just it just hadn't been there. It hadn't been there in the same way that I've never been to Singapore. Would you, would you testify for the Haitian government if you want to do that? I really would like for you to do that. Cool. Because it, 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 it is a big, I'm from Haiti myself. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm sorry if you haven't finished it. But no, no, no. That, that, that was a very, you know, in, in the 1990s, I, as a friend, I went to medical school in 1983 to 1987. Mm -hmm. and then finished medical school. You know, I went to Valley Left, Baby Dog, and I went to Canada, and long story. Mm -hmm. But now I went back to work for the Asian government. And, and we know, and I really commend you for having the courage to say something like that, because we know what took place in Haiti. Mm -hmm. What are the AIDS virus? <coughs> What are the Ebola we just had now? That doesn't have nothing to do with Haiti at all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Exactly. I remember I went to Belgium and, and I really wanted to make sure that I spoke to the professor. We conduct a lot of studies <coughs> in the 60s in, in Congo. Because what's happening in Haiti, the value, the value had two solutions for the intellectuals of the country. Those he couldn't kill, he sent them to Africa. You know, if you were not, if you were too much uh, a problem for him, uh, you probably will not make it. But if you are not too much of a problem, why well, not we'll send you back to Africa? Go to the Congos, go to the Chad. There is not one African speaking country of the 11, mm -hmm. what we call the Congo African, that not an Haitian intellectual has happened there. What everything. So some Haitian did it in the Congo, mm -hmm. which used country now, it's called Zaire, did it did come in contact with some people who were very much involved in, in eating the bush meat. That could be a case. But that was a very big, I'm glad to say that. You know, that has really hurt in the Haitian community for a long, long time. We have him, myself, we had, I think we were well, more than close to 100 Haitians, whether in New York or in Florida, who had committed suicide uh, because of the stigma that was associated with the country. The same thing with the Ebola. Yeah. Now, that's why yeah. I asked you, would you testify? The United Nations, by denying, and they still, they are still denying now, as I'm talking to you now, right that the cholera just came exactly from those Nepalese soldiers who were not using proper hygiene technique, let the, the fish get into the water, and then, you know, it doesn't have nothing. You know, absolutely, and I'm, and I'm very moved by what you just said here, that wasn't a Haitian government now, not long ago, at the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem also we have when we talk about narrative is how do we get a poor Haitian person to realize, hey, well, what you have now is a communicable disease. You need to go see that yeah. before going to the shaman, before going to the voodoo priest. Now, we had the same problem in the 80s with AIDS. I myself, at the medical school, you hear very often people will come, well, uh, what you have is a zombie from a, a diarrhea zombie. Mm -hmm. They have different kind of zombie thing, you know. The zombie you have is a, is a zombie that had diarrhea, then that's why you have diarrhea. You don't need to go to that. <laughs> <But> <laughs> no? I, I, think, I think I understand what you're yeah. saying. But Paul Farmer has written on this in really important ways. And he said, you know, there is an assumption. So he, he had this kind of problem where he was not having people, he was treating tuberculosis. And he was having people dying of it who shouldn't have been dying of it. And he said, um, you know, I, I don't understand why this is happening. And he collected his staff at the hospital. And he said to the Western doctors, and most of the doctors were Western, he said, you know, I, um, what do you think? And they said, you know, People are superstitious, they're going to other kinds of doctors, they're not coming for treatment. And he said to the nursing staff, which was more, you know, mostly indigenous, Haitian, and they said, no, it's poverty. It's the fact that they can't travel the distance to come back and get and you know get the rest of the medicine. Or they're living in inadequate shelters and their bodies just can't you know, can't respond, or they're not getting enough nutrition and they can't metabolize. When he heard that, 
and changed his narrative about what the problem was, he had a hundred percent success rate. You know, and and he changed his practice. He went and delivered. He he made food and shelter and uh, doctors traveling to um, you know locations where people couldn't afford to take a day away from their job to travel to the hospital. He made that all part of medical practice, and it was a completely different story. So I think that's important too. Yeah, I mean, I'm not he's doing a very good job. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm him. He's yeah. doing a very wonderful job. You know, poverty is a big. Good yeah. I would just like to open it up to questions now right, from anyone in the audience. And also, just to can I um, the thing I was going to say to you to support your point about the association with place. Um, there was a school in New Jersey that had to quarantine two new students because um, the parents were threatening not to send their children to school. The students were from Rwanda. Rwanda doesn't have Ebola. We have more Ebola than Rwanda has. And, you know, but somehow or another, rather than educating the parents and saying, you don't know, you know, here's a map, you know, let's start there. Um, they closed, they, they quarantined, they voluntarily, the children, parents voluntarily. I heard something similar about someone like a missionary going to South Africa. When they returned, they were forced to be quarantined. There was, so, there was, so there was, there was a case this week in, in my, my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, a teacher who had just come back from a, I think it was a mission trip in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, she was teaching at a Catholic, I think, elementary school in Louisville, and they wanted her to do a 21-day yeah, quarantine. That's what did. And she ended up uh, resigning. I guess there's some debate in the specific story about whether she had other grievances that made her leave her job. Mm -hmm. At the very least, this seems to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, Nairobi is as is uh, a thousand miles closer to Freetown mm -hmm. than Louisville. So it's, it's about 3,500 miles from Nairobi to Freetown, Sierra Leone. Um, it's about uh, 4,500 from Louisville to Sierra Leone. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions they'd like to, to bring up to discuss? Sure. So, but of course, it's not really about geographical distance. Right. Right. right? It's <laughs> this, you built a much more complex argument. Yeah. So you've sort of diagnosed issues. I'd like to push us to what do we do now? that we've all had this conversation, we've observed, we have this analytical framework. How do we dislodge, how do we nudge this narrative in a different way? So, so yeah. let me start just by observing when yeah. Priscilla started talking about oh, doing her work in contagion, in the 80s, the internet was a completely different story, right? right. right? right. Sure. So what about the global media? What about social media? How do we get global and local medias and narratives on the same level? Yeah. It seems like we should, be able to do that theoretically, mm -hmm. how can we nudge this narrative into a much more complex well, I'll, I'll, direction? I'll, trans, I'll, I'll try to give it. Because I, 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 yeah. I get asked that all the time. Well, right? I, like, as, a, as, a, as a journalist, I will, I will, like, I will, I will take the question and transmit it to okay. a question well, for you that I, that I had. I have an answer to it, so it's okay. <laughs> well, so, but, 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 I mean, because this is something that I struggle with a lot mm -hmm. as a journalist, um, because the the choices, in this case and in the case of many of the narratives that we find ourselves falling into, are not between the popular attention-getting narrative and the smarter, uh, you know, more nuanced narrative in terms of actually getting people talking about the story. It's between basically like the Hollywood narrative and not. Because one of the interesting things, I mean, you know, and this is something that is just going to fascinate and haunt me until the day I die or leave journalism or a bowl, which may be the same day, um, uh, which is how the heck do you get people to pay attention to anything? And it, it, it all, I mean, it, it often seems almost entirely random. And, and part of it certainly is, I mean, part of the reason why Ebola has gotten people's attention, but for instance, the chikungunya epidemic that's going around the Caribbean right now, which is huge, it's, it's a, it's a mosquito-borne disease, disastrous effects on the economy, we don't know what its morbidity is because it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be killing people directly, but it's probably leading to lots of deaths one way or another, it's, it's having a huge effect, of, but you could not pay people to care about it. And part of the reason is because chikungunya does not at all fit into the outbreak yeah, narrative. Yeah, yeah. And so, the transmitted question for you, and maybe this is what you were going to answer, in which case I'm just waiting. No, 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 no. Um, is, so, you know, 
those of us who, who see the matrix, those of us who, who can think of ways of, of doing these stories better, but have, no, but have no real way to figure out how to do those smarter stories in a way that anyone's going to pay attention to. Because let's be honest, we're all busy. No matter how many social media accounts you have, you're paying, it almost makes it worse. Like you're hit with such a storm of stuff on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram that you're only paying attention to like the most exciting things, the things that you think are practical information that you need today. If we take away this part of the outbreak narrative that is basically you are all going to die tomorrow unless you do, we don't even know what, you're just all going to die. Um, how is there any way to get people to pay attention, or are we basically just talking about stopping coverage of these things entirely and, and hoping that people start tuning into academic journals? And mm -hmm. So there are, there are three different questions, and you know there are three answers. And I talk a lot. I get this question all the time, and I've heard exactly what you've said from journalists. So let me start with the last part. I had a journalist from the Washington Post say to me, we, had a, we spent an hour talking about this issue, she was writing a piece, and she said, if you had your, your druthers, your, your choice, how would, I how would I write this piece? How would I start this piece? And I said, you would start by identifying for people why they have the fear. So you don't want to just say to them, don't be afraid. Yeah, that's going to work. You know, my son was afraid of vampires as a six-year-old, and I told him not to be, and gosh, he didn't believe me. You know, so you know, you're, that's not going to work. But if you say the reason people are afraid is we have been telling the story this way, and that is not true, but, and she did. She started her piece that way. So it is possible, and it got published, and I, you know, I don't know what effect it had, but you know, I'm going to be hopeful. I think it had a good one. So there are ways of telling this story differently and of addressing it. I then was on a radio show with one of her colleagues who said, we, journalists are telling everyone the truth. We should be terrified. And I thought, oh boy, one step forward, two steps back. So, you know, I don't know. So the first thing is to have an alternative story to tell. The second thing, and, and for me, it's as an educator, right? I have the liberty, the, the freedom to um, have classrooms of students or to be able to give a lecture and I can tell a more elaborated version and I don't need to be sensationalist right. to, to do that. You have this much space and you have to grab headlines and grab attention. That's a different problem. So I'll come back to that. I mean, what I said, you know, what this woman did was seemed to me a great, a great solution. She did it really well. Um, so first we need a new story and then we need to make that new story sound biteable. Not even necessarily sexy, but just sound biteable. And um, the new story Paul Farmer has already told. The outbreak narrative doesn't begin with the outbreak. It begins like 10 years earlier. He tells the story about Haiti, so let's go to Haiti. Um, Paul Farmer was working in the Canche, a particularly impoverished section of Haiti, and there were all these narratives about this as a diseased place, as a place with high crime, etc. And he said, fine. How did it become that way? This was a community of sustainable agriculture where people were doing really well and it wasn't diseased and crime ridden. What happened? Well, the Haitian elite had a compact with American corporations. They built the Pelegre Dam. It was good for some people. Nobody thought about, you know, or if they did, didn't care about who it was going to displace. The, the arable land was flooded. These people had to move up on, onto a mountaintop where the soil was not arable, and then they lived in poverty. And what does poverty breed? Disease and crime, right? So let's tell the outbreak narrative as that broader story. That's what I can do in my classrooms. That's when I can, what I can do in a setting like this. How do you tell that, right? As I said, I'm seeing more and more journalists say poverty. I'm seeing Margaret Chan get head headlines by saying, why are we not returning to Alma Ata? And people don't know what Alma Ata is, that has to be, you know. So Alma Ata was a um, 1978, um, very uh, well attended conference. I can't remember, it was like 129 or something nations and a bunch of um, 59, 69 um, uh, NGOs. And they all got together and they had an analysis of you know, this situation that we're talking about, not just with communicable disease, but with things that people were dying of, like heart disease, that they didn't need to be dying of. And there was a commitment by all the people at this conference that they would work for universal access to health care by the year 2000. And in 2008, on the 30th anniversary, Margaret Chan gave a big lecture saying, return to Alma Ata, and she said, why aren't we listening? 
This is, first of all, and most importantly, the humanitarian thing to be doing. Health is a human right, right? Access to primary health care, training of people in communities, building of clinics in communities, allowing people to define what they mean by health, all of those things are basic human rights. And economists like, again, Amartya Sen and others say, it is actually affordable. So it's the right thing to do. It's also the economically sound thing to do. If we wait for a pandemic, not Ebola, but something like avian, <coughs> avian flu, the cost is going to be so much larger than the infrastructural changes we could be making them. Making. Why aren't we making them? And to me, you know, it's a question of resources, priorities, politics. It is also a question of narrative. It is a problem we are not properly diagnosing. Is this really not something that, and I am seeing, as I said, journalists starting to tell that story. They are starting to talk about poverty. I am starting to see these figures get quoted. People are going to listen if they read it, you know, in, in the New York <coughs> Times, in the Washington Post. As you said, social media. Get it out in, on social media. And how do you do it? First, you have to have the right story to tell. And then you have to, the next move is educate not just, you know, in my case, people in my classes, but journalists. And, you know, have teams of people going out and saying, here's how you can tell this story in a really exciting and compelling way. You know, and, and I don't, I don't think that's so, I mean, I, again, I'm seeing it. Right. So I don't think it's impossible. It's not impossible. Yeah, um, and that's what you're doing. Yeah, I like to think that I do. Yeah, people absolutely. Call the big truck that went I think you do. But also no, you're doing it when you, right, right? You, no, no, exactly, yes. But it's, but, well, not you have to cover a bullet. Right. But you can cover it by saying, you know, here, you know, obviously you're not going to tell the story I right. just said in the middle of a pandemic, but you can say, this, we are afraid of this because they because we have all of these biases they are they are um, creating this epidemic of panic this number of people die from, from influenza every year you know here is what what and you know what's really happening in, in a the Ebola and you know nobody who has contracted in the United States has even died of it in the United States here's why people are dying of it in Sierra Leone that's what we should be addressing right. and you can put that in four paragraphs yeah, yeah, no, so, you're absolutely right. Although the one the, the, the one caveat to that is, um, you know, and, and and wrestling with narratives and people's expectations. You talked about the guy that you heard on the radio. And yeah, oh, there are millions I was talking of them. to him. He was on. Oh, you're show. talking to him. And I was saying, really, but what about? And he's no. We should be terrified. Right. The media's informing us, and we should be terrified. And I'm thinking. It's like a, you know. This is the problem. I, I like he he liked the first answer. He got. Yeah. But but the, but part of the issue is. And this is something, by the way, that's that's true in, in natural disaster. It's it's very true in climate change, yeah. and this is going to be an, a, a bigger and bigger issue. How do you get people to stop and pay attention to the things that they ought to be paying attention to to make the big changes and the infrastructure investments to? Well, you don't use the um, headline "apocalypse!" exclamation point. You don't use the headline. Um, you know, uh, Ebola, the ISIS of epidemics. But the problem, well, but, but the problem and is... And John Stewart took that up in Colbert, and, you know, and that was all good. And, and, and social media. But, but, the, but, the, but, the, but the problem is, the problem is getting that, getting their attention in the first place, yeah. because what ends up happening is the things in which we try mm -hmm. to orchestrate those conversations happen in the topics that, I don't know, I don't think it's totally organic, I don't think it's totally conspiratorial, like, I don't know what it is. Like I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to figure this out. But, you know, people, you know, the, it, it's the earthquake that gets people's attention. It's a certain epidemic, but not another one that gets well, people's and attention. I, well, that I have, I mean, yeah. Ebola, because it is something that really most people don't have to be afraid of in the United States. Right. So therefore, we can pay attention to it. If you think about, you know, the real statistic is car accidents. Right. If you thought about your chances of dying or being, you know, maimed, sorry folks, but in a car accident, yeah. you know, in your lifetime, you'd never get in your car and everything would stop. Right. So we can't afford that fear and we don't have it. Ebola channels our fear. We can be terrified of it because really deep down, people know in the United States, this is not going to be something that, you know, anyone in this room is going to die of, certainly not this, this time. Right. Um, and therefore, we can panic about it. It's the exceptional things that we can be afraid of, and because there is that resolution that's part of the outbreak narrative. 
being titillated and afraid is part of the frisson of it, we know that this is really something that, that's not going to do it. I have one more good news thing, and then I, I do I see a question. But my good news is I've been tracking um, epidemics for a long time right. and the coverage of them. And I see consistent moves towards people saying, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Mm -hmm. Fear is worse. And, you know, in AIDS, there were HIV AIDS, there were few people. There were many in SARS. There are enormous, more than not, I right. would say, are saying this is not a reason for panic. This Washington Post guy was more anomalous in this case. We're still telling that outbreak narrative, um, but there's more and more people telling this other story. And so that's the good news, I think. You guys are doing a good job. Yeah, we're all going out of business, but we're doing a good job. <laughs> I actually don't have a question. I have some observations. But yeah. if someone does Please. have a question, no, no, go ahead. first. No. Well, just keeping it to the Petri dish. Oh, by the way, my name is Katrina. I'm a graduate student here with the Global Health Program. Hi, Katrina. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so just keeping it within the Petri dish of America media and America public. Um, Priscilla, while you, your points you're made, I think are very accurate if you're speaking to academia, mm -hmm. I don't think they are as applicable to the lay public. And what I'm saying is, even if you don't start out with these crazy headlines, or if you give them a rationale of why not to be afraid, people in the lay public, they will always stay with their bias unless they're educated not to, to recognize their own bias and to... Uh, well, that's what I everything else. Yeah. So it like works first in the classroom. Yeah. But I mean, but I mean, I said it to the woman at the Washington Post. She did it. You know how effective it is. I don't know. I I've been on a lot of radio shows. I mean, I don't. The the way that I've talked about it here, I have sound bites. So I talk about it very differently when I'm on a radio show and I have four minutes or CCTV or something like that, and I have four minutes. But I have found, you know, I mean, I mean, sound bites are good, but people want the sensational. And like even speaking with my parents, one of my parents had more education than the other. And speaking with one of them, um, I was able to talk about how actually influenza or some other diseases should actually be grabbing our concern much more than Ebola for the simple facts of the, the numbers. I mean, they're not going to explode over here. There's no reason to panic, despite what anyone might or might not say. But on the other side, they, they want something to panic about. So the other one... I would give them both the same reasons, but they hear it and they come back to the whole, but this is sensational, basically. Well, it's, it's fiendishly difficult, and, and I'll throw in one additional reason why, in addition to, to people's own sort of <coughs> personal biases and predilections, and that is that there is serious uh, political and monetary capital oh, behind yes. a well, lot of these latent ideas. And, and just to give, I mean, just to give a reflection of that in, in the coverage of um, Ebola, because I've also, you know, made a buck here and there over the last couple of weeks writing the "Don't Panic" piece. But one of the one of the things that's interesting is, you know, I'm coming to it from the disaster foreign correspondents. Mm -hmm. I've lived around the world point of view. My colleagues in the media who are doing, who have done a less good job of. Um, covering this along the high-minded principles that we are throwing around here, um, tend to be in the political press. And the reason for that mm -hmm. is not because they're stupid, um, and not because they're lazy, um, and not even because they're ignorant, although they're ignorant of some of the things that they're talking about, but because they operate in a world in which their uh, value and credibility as a journalist has to do a lot with making sure that they don't sound like they're coming too strongly on one side of the partisan divide or other, and not making it, they're, they're terrified, just like everybody else in Washington is, of sounding like they're the people that basically the, a lot of the guys who got elected yesterday are telling you that Washington is out of touch, top down, they know what's best for you, and they're going to come and tell you what the world is, but you, the salt of the earth, you know what's really going on, and you got to go back and tell those fat cats what's up. And that's th that's the paradigm that they operate in. And so the problem is that when you when you come into a situation like the Ebola epidemic, and it, and, and you can sort of feel the moment that it gets like like I don't remember what day it was, but I remember just noticing like it just happened. It gets sucked up into the into the mill, right? And it just and and now it's part of the political thing and. Now we're actually, like I said, we were talking about immigration, we're talking about everything except actually talking about public health. 
Um, at that point, the political journalists basically feel I have to give, I have to seriously consider unserious ideas. I have to pretend like fools who have no idea what they're talking about. I, I, I think I tweeted during the, the debate between Hagen and Tillis, listening to the two of them argue over how to deal with the Ebola epidemic. It was like watching two poodles fight over how to fly an F-16. They had no idea what they were talking about, yeah. but they were really, and the yeah. political journalists have to take that seriously. And one of the things that you have to consider is that part of the reason why they feel that they have to take that seriously is there is serious money and serious power invested in these bad narratives. And people are making money off of it, and they're and they're and they're holding power off of it. And changing that is way harder than getting people to watch a movie that you didn't think that they were going to go. Watch. Yes, but I would also let me let me also address. I think that um, what you're saying is true, short term. But I have you know I really do have a response here. First of all, academia. I mean, my students are going to go off and be policymakers and journalists and whatever. I mean, I teach. You know, a hundred people, who, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't know how many people go through my classes, but whatever. Um, those people are going to go off and do things. The people who read my op-eds, the people who read my book, the people, you know, it's not a large number, but it's a beginning, and those things, um, you know, that, that moves into the world. So that's the long term. Short term, I think one, one thing that I think is really important to keep in mind, when someone hears global poverty, they say, too big to address it. Yeah. Right? We need to change those narratives, and we can change those narratives. And I feel the same way about this. And I see you're looking skeptical. I'm not going to convince you, but <laughs> no, no, you know, no, they're just but, you're you're soundbiting a very complex issue. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, because I don't think, yes. but, um, I, and that's why I didn't comment. But yeah. but I think that there's. I mean, I think it. What I do think is important is not to have a global sense that this is too big to deal with. I think that is a really, I mean, that that thinking, and this is again what, you know, what um, Margaret Chan was saying, that in the UN Millennium Development Goals, you know, that actually if you do these few things, we can start to address these issues. Why aren't we? And I think you're absolutely right about the political, what is behind the narratives, but, and we need to address that. I'm not saying the narrative alone. But we can also address the narratives. And we don't have to accept those narratives. And we can keep making that point. And people will, even if it's slow, people will hear it. And what I don't want anyone to come away with is, yeah, yeah, that's too idealistic and it's not going to work. Because I think then it won't, for right. sure. Rice bowls get broken all the time. Yeah. So it's 1 o'clock now. So if anyone needs to move on with the rest of your day, we thank you for coming. And anyone who has any, wants to stick around and keep talking, if there's another question, uh, we'd be happy. Uh, OK. Good. You, you have a question? Yeah, I mean, this is a kind of slightly different angle on the, on the question of how do you get people's attention. I would, and as we're talking, I keep thinking about these, um, there's like a science of clickbait that's been developed now where we have Upworthy or BuzzFeed or places like that, that or even Facebook with their experiments on what people think they should do or what they don't. And I'm wondering, you know, what you think the prospects are, as distasteful as it is, of using those techniques to change the narrative in a way that gets people to pay attention, even if it's in kind of short term, the viral, um, an, an ironic sense, making this idea spread, the right idea spread rather than wrong. Well, we're, we're, we're seeing that to an extent. Um, one, one site, one, or one, I guess, like Facebook page that has found a way to go viral by uh, countering popular narratives is uh, the very popular I fucking love science that a lot of people oh, yeah. love. <laughs> or even fucking love. Um, now, that has itself come under criticism um, from many in the scientific community, for instance, for, first of all, sometimes just flat out getting things wrong, also uh, 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 soundbiting very complex issues in, in you know, single you know, panel memes. Um, I, think that, I think that what that site's popularity reflects is that there is a hunger among a, a substantial portion of the population for counter-narratives that they at least feel are smarter, uh, you know, showing the matrix, going more in depth. Um, also, there are things, uh, uh, you know, in, in life and in science um, that have, you know, 
uh, first of all, as for instance, the effects of global climate change become more immediate, they're no longer theoretical. We watch many of them happening in, in real time. Um, you know, there are more people that just sort of look out their window and realize, hey, this is going on, maybe I should pay attention to it. And, and, and that, that is a way of using this science of quick bait. But um, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is the thing that we're fighting against. We've been fighting against this in journalism for, or, or fighting with it or dealing with it or, or trying to figure out what the hell to do, basically since, you know, American and, and Western newspaper journalism started. People buy tabloids. Can I write a smarter tabloid? Sort of, but like part of the tabloid format is just being dumb and immediately comprehensible and sensationalistic and getting people's attention. So how can I be dumb and immediately comprehensible and simplistic and sensationalistic in a way that's not dumb, immediately comprehensible? <laughs> um, and, and I don't know the answer to it. And, you know, I mean, one thing that, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding about the book. One of the reasons why I, 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 you know, I was a wire service reporter. And one of the reasons why I felt compelled to um, go into a hole in, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and, you know, sit there every day writing this thing for a year was that I was so sick of uh, either pitching stories to my boss that, that uh, they didn't want to take because they didn't understand what I was talking about, or having to you know waste three quarters of a thousand word story just trying to explain the paradigm that I was trying to discuss and why the paradigm which a reader may be approaching the story from was wrong, um, and, and and being in a context where I wasn't where I didn't have to be afraid of telling somebody you're wrong because it was only my reputation on the line instead of my entire organization. Um, and I do think that movies and books and new forms of narrative and things like that can do that, permeate the culture and then get reduced to clickbait and, and, and disseminate more widely like that. But honestly, if anybody had the answer of exactly how to do that, they would be doing it and making billions of dollars. Right now. Well, there, and we're not going to resolve any fear. I mean, it's not like nobody's going to be, you know, I mean, fear is just part of life. Well, you're going to die, it's, so you yeah. should be afraid of something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or no, whatever. But, no, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you're or not be afraid. Right, yeah. um, no, just that I think that, but I, but I do think that there's a way, you know, that you can, um, you know, it's not like we want to eradicate the problem. Right. It's that we want to, you know, make small changes in what we see and what we can do. Yeah, totally. And I think that's what I was arguing against. I, I don't think we should ever have a totalizing, but ultimately getting rid of this problem, you know, is is never gonna happen and so what do we do? I mean, we you know, light a candle. Right. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. so on that note I think this is a, a good place to wrap up. Um, thank, you, thank you, both of you. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>